Okay. Missing Hello. Helen Paul. Okay, so we'll get started. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, the first thing that we have on the agenda is announcements. Um, I have two. This, and I'll, does anybody else have an announcement? I have an announcement. Okay. John, you can go first. Okay. Well, uh, there are two more or less retirements that have taken place in the last week. <coughs> Um, first, uh, Nate Buddington is no longer on the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, he's been on, I guess, for two terms for the last six years, and uh, he's been chair for the last two years. And he's really been a great supporter of affordable housing for us. Um, you know, he's certainly favored the things that we've favored, money for the housing trust, support of money for 132 Northampton Road. And that's both in EPAC meetings and also before town council. So I, I don't know who succeeds them. I'm not sure whether they've had a vote yet, but uh, I do know that Nate's off and um, we'll certainly miss him. The other retirement that I wanted to mention is Joanne Campbell. After 20 years as executive director of Valley Community Development, and I guess two more years on staff, she is taking retirement. And I think that's very significant for us and for Hampshire County and others in the Pioneer Valley. Uh, Joanne has provided great leadership over the years, um, in addition to um, uh, working with Laura to spearhead the work at uh, Amherst Studio Apartments, 132 Northampton Road. Um, she also was involved in developing a family housing development in Amherst, I think it was 12 years ago, uh, Valley Main Street Apartments. Um, she's also been a great source of wisdom and advice for me and, uh, you know, she's participated certainly in some of our meetings and also meetings of the Amherst Housing Coalition. So I'm definitely going to miss Joanne. Uh, there is a new executive director, Jane Lockyer, um, who has appeared on some of the calls with the Zoning uh, Board of Appeals. Um, so we welcome Jane, but there's no question that we're going to miss uh, Joanne. So those were two things I wanted to mark. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything about Joanne or Nate. I mean, Tom, you've known Joanne for longer, much longer than I have. She's an amazing woman who's been, like you said, a tremendous leader for the area and uh, just a really nice, uh, uh, calm and, uh, and hardworking for uh, affordable housing. Yeah. That place was uh, pretty chaotic when she started. And uh, she, she turned it into a very, very uh, effective uh, agency. So she Nate, will then, yeah. Thanks. Um, Nate, you said you had an announcement also. <clears throat> yeah, the, um, I had a call today with Mass Housing. They have it's been, they have an, uh, a relatively new program. It's been around for um, six or eight months. It's their, um, it, they call it, I guess, like their Commonwealth Builder Program. It's for workforce housing, for home ownership, is what they were looking at. And um, they have 60 million for the program. And they still have a fair amount of money still to give out. And you have to be either Gateway City um, or a qualified census tract or, um, I guess the city of Boston qualifies, but Amherst has qualified census tracts. And so they were just, they've reached out to every community that could, I guess, possibly qualify. And they asked if, you know, they, we just talked about it and I had some information sent to me this evening, but you know, um, you know, they're looking at like a 20 to 30 minimum, 20 to 30 minimum uh, unit home ownership project. And, you know, I thought the East street school could be, something that might be relevant. You know, it's up to $150,000 subsidy per unit. It's a, it's actually at the closing. So it's, um, you know, developer would still need to 
take out construction loans, but then there would be a um, repayment at the time of closing. And then they only asked for a 15 year deed restriction because they're trying to build equity. So the program really started to advance home ownership and equity in um, minority populations and populations that don't typically have home ownership. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if it's something that could work in Amherst, but it seems like they're, um, they said they probably have, you know, I don't know, a third of it is probably in projects already. Some of it is, you know, um, really prospective projects. And then they have a lot that just isn't committed yet. So they're looking to get projects going. So, you know, whether or not it's an Amherst, but um, it's up to 120% AMI. And uh, like I said, only a 15 year deed restriction. And you can combine it with other funding, you know, but then you'd have to lower the AMI. So uh, and they're really hoping to get projects that are already through the zoning process. They don't want to get burned by projects that, you know, may not come to fruition. So, you know, it's okay if we have something that might be a year or two out, but I just thought that we could have a future discussion if we think it's a project that's worthwhile. It, it can't fund a home ownership program where, you know, they give out grants to different first time home buyers. But I asked that, I thought that'd be a better way to go. <laughs> Amherst, if we could get $10 million in, or whatever, $3 million and do home ownership, but it doesn't work that way. Well, if not East Street, maybe Strong Street. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. They do, you know, condos or, you know, um, any type of home ownership unit it can be mixed rental and home ownership, but they would just, you know, subsidize the home ownership. Okay, well, great. That's good news. Okay, yeah. the, the next item is review of minutes from June 11th. Um, I sent those out, I think, earlier this week, or maybe earlier than that. Uh, so does anybody have any comments on the minutes? If <coughs> not, then they'll be accepted as submitted. <clears throat> no comments? Okay. Yeah, I have a comment. <clears throat> oh. Um, in, uh, in the discussion about 132 Northampton Road, I, I think Laura um, invited us or, or implied that, that we were welcome to help come up with a name for the, for oh, the house. Mm. Yeah. That's right, I forgot about that. And are you saying that's not reflected the way you want it to be, or? I don't think I see it at all. Maybe I just missed it. <clears throat> no, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, a big, it's not a big deal. Yeah. yeah, but you don't have a name tonight, do you, Rob? No, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Is that but what it's you're something going? to keep in mind. If, if something comes up, we should. You know, yeah, we should I think that's that good. Way. I can add that sentence to the notes. I'll make sure that's in there. If that's what we want to do. Sure, yeah. thanks, John. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, so with that amendment, I think we'll accept the minutes as submitted, mm -hmm. and we're ready to move on to the discussion of the Amherst COVID-19 Emergency Rental Assistance Grant Program. And uh, as people know, I invited Jana Tetro. Jana is the Assistant Director for Community Services for Community Action Pioneer Valley. And she is the person primarily responsible for administering this program on our behalf. So I asked Jana to do a few things, including introducing the program. And then beyond that, there are a few open issues uh, I think we, we could discuss. And also we should go over the uh, work that we've done to date on marketing the program and see if people have any other ideas. So I think that's the main focus of this agenda item. It's probably our biggest agenda item. So with that, I think I'll give uh, Jana the floor. Right. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, you have the flyer here in front of you. And uh, I think John forwarded the application earlier today that we uh yeah there it is um <laughs> um 
So it's, I mean, so the program guidelines are, you know, basically what the town of Amherst asked us to do. Um, so you need to live in Amherst. You need to be a renter. You can be of any immigration status. You need to have reduced or no income due to uh, COVID-19 since April 1st. Um, you cannot be currently um, either living in subsidized housing, have a Section 8 voucher, have an MRVP voucher, um, be currently receiving RAFT, except if you're receiving RAFT for utility support. Um, the We are following the low-income housing tax credit rules around um, students. Excuse me, so I can't be entirely comprised of college students. There are exceptions to that. So if you are a single parent, full-time student, and your children are full-time students, then that would be, or you know, your school-age children, that would be fine. Um, you can't have sufficient, you, you have to have insufficient income to uh, pay your rent for three months. Uh, there's income limits. We're gonna do a lottery and preference will be given to families with children under the age of 18. Um, I will say that we are off to a great start. I'm actually, I was a little surprised. We've gotten 26 applications since Monday at 5 p.m. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, yep, it, yeah, it was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, of the 26, 22 of them are complete. Um, four of them are partial. So what I realize is happening is if you go, and this may have happened to any of you who went to look at the online application, if you go onto the online application and you either start filling it out or you even just look at it and then you close your browser, the online platform we're using then counts that as a partial application. So uh, I have four, as of 4 p.m., I have four that are partial. Some of them um, clearly, you know, wrote their first name and then in the email address and then closed the browser. So I don't think that those folks even actually know that they submitted an application, so we, I need to contact them. That would include me, Jana. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it included me this morning because I kept thinking, <laughs> why is this happening? Um, yeah, I looked at it too, I think, so uh, on Monday, so I, you know, <laughs> I might be one of those. Yeah, I did, I did too, but I didn't write anything anywhere, so I don't I didn't know, either. maybe I didn't it didn't either, count yeah. that. <laughs> Some of them were blank, so I meant to look to see if I could change a setting so that would stop happening just because it's, I mean, it's fine, but it's a little confusing. Um, of the, So of the 26, three of them so far appear to be ineligible. I have two that live in subsidized housing um, and one that lives in Leverett. So I will follow up with them. Um, the good news on the people who live in subsidized housing, or good news, bad news, is that they they, t they appear to owe rent, owe back rent, but Community Action has a whole lot of other money that we can spend on those folks. And so we can just contact them, let them know they're ineligible for this program, but can actually then most likely assist them with some other funds that we have. So um, I think that's, that'll be fine. Um, and uh, of, let me see, five of them, which is what most interesting to me just looking at the ones that we've gotten is only five people are behind in their rent. Um, so we have a lot of proactive folks, which is great. Um, but I was surprised. I thought more people would be behind. There's definitely a lot of comments about people worried that their unemployment is going to end. Um, so I think this, you know, is perhaps what you all were thinking about when you designed this program is that it really could help folks who aren't behind, maybe not get behind or, you know, help keep them afloat longer. Um, so we, uh, yeah, so we've worked out some of our procedures about how we're going to handle this. Again, I, the volume is a bit higher than I expected in the first three days, um, but we have staff working to contact the completed application folks. Um, the way that it works is we fill out the online application. It doesn't ask you to submit anything. And so we have a, a, a program called ShareFile that's a Citrix program that we've been using for our other programs that you send basically an email to the applicant that's set with a link for them to upload, for example, their pay stub or their, um, you know, their documentation of their COVID related income loss or reduction. So we have staff that are basically dedicated to this project that are going to be 
contacting those folks. Some people uh, also have some, some, you know, there's some questions missing on their application. So we just need to clarify. Um, one person has $11 million in listed as income. And I think that that's just a, again. <laughs> <That's> fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it is. And then it's like, oh, okay, that's clearly wrong. So, you know, sometimes, you know, when you people are filling it out themselves, they make mistakes. And so we just need to make sure that we know we have all the correct information. And so all these applications started to interrupt, they've been submitted online, right? Mm -hmm. So they, someone, they've been. Yeah. Right. So we haven't, I don't think as of today, have had any requests for the paper applications. We've gotten some calls. Um, We've now at the top of the online application, it says in Spanish, if you need assistance with the application to call community action and we have bilingual staff that can help folks um, either do it with them over the phone and, do, and translate it into Spanish or uh, we'll figure out how to get those folks the application. Um, and that, yeah, though that's, I mean, I've seen John sent it out a lot of places, so that's clearly working. Um, it popped up on my Facebook feed in several places already. Uh, so, I mean, that's my update. I'm happy to answer questions or other concerns that folks have. Yeah, I'll just say quickly that, you know, we, the town put it on, you know, our website and our Facebook page and we emailed every, every landlord who's registered for the rental program. So Great. now, now um, this week, uh, you know, to, I don't know, how many hundreds of landlords should have received it this week? I know some have because they've emailed back. So um, that hit a lot of people. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Jenna, I, I got a question. This is Sid. Um, for our non English speakers, you did say that you do have Spanish speakers, but as we know in Amherst, you know, we have Cambodian, Vietnamese, Laotian, Portuguese, we have all these other folks um, who. Um, don't speak English. You know, when I took a look at the uh, at the application, I understand why you need all that information. But when you first look at it, it can it can look overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think it's like six or seven uh, pages. So for our non-English speakers outside of Spanish, what mm -hmm. kind of help is there for them? Um, so we uh, Community Action has a contract or an account with the Language Line. Okay. So um, I think that that is probably what we would do if we had folks who um, uh, were speaking non, you know, something other than Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. And we would use the language line to probably, uh, we have the application, the staff have it in a fillable form, so they could go through the application with the person on the phone, um, which could be time consuming. Um, but I'm open to other suggestions if there's other, um, community organizations that we could work with to help with translation. I'm happy to, to reach out to them. And um, we, so and on the Amherst webpage, you know, the way we embed text is that if someone uses Google Translate or if they have a software yeah. that they can, it translates everything to their native language. And I think we accommodate up to 80 languages. So I don't I know think if the software helpful. program does the same thing. So if someone, I don't, you know, cause it's, it's different when you're in this, when you're in the application, it's not, you know, like the web page is the software. So I don't, I don't know if they would offer a way to, to do that. So. Okay. I can look into that. Yeah. I mean, that would be, yeah, the would be very helpful. Yeah. Thanks. That way you don't have to, you know, translate over the phone. It's, you know, if someone has technical difficulties, you could, you know, but you know, I work, I worked with our IT on that. So whatever we put on our website can be translated, I guess, pretty easily. I don't, I don't know how clean it is. Like, I don't know how accurate it is to different languages. It's, it's, it's fairly accurate. I, you know, I, I, I do, I check the Portuguese translation. It's, it's fairly accurate. It's okay. not a hundred percent, but it, it gets the point across. Let's put it this way. You would understand. Oh, good. Yeah. Sometimes we're told not to. Yeah. Sometimes if IT notices that something we want on the web page is either like, you know, Compound sentences or something that may be difficult to translate, they'll you know they'll let staff know. So, yep. <clears throat> I was just wondering where else. I mean, it went to landlords, it went to programs. I wonder if there's any like just general public outreach and papers or any other. What other kinds of outreach things have happened? If if they have. 
Yeah, it's in the Gazette. It will probably be in the bulletin. I just made a note to myself. I had meant, I thought I'd emailed it, but I'll double check to the Amherst Human Service Network and to COSA, to the uh, Hampshire Council of Service Agencies. Um, and that'll hit a pretty broad, you know, a lot of agencies can then have that information. Does that include the Community Health Center? They're part of, I think, the Human Service Network, the Amherst Human Service Network, but yep. Yeah. They just make sure, yeah. We also are in the process of doing a mailing, uh, not specifically for this, but just in general of all of the programs, uh, sort of COVID related programs that Community Action has. And we, uh, we're sending out 2,800 postcards. I think they went out today, um, not specifically in Amherst, but I think the Amherst, there's like at least 200 families on the Amherst list um, using our fuel assistance database. So that will also hit um, people, some people directly at home. Um, I know that I've emailed and I might send out some more emails um, to like family outreach of Amherst I told Laura Reichman to Amherst Community Connections, Wei Ling, uh, to Craig Stores, Kevin Noonan, and also uh, to the Amherst Tenant Assistance Program run by Julie Fetterman and Nancy Schroeder. So those are all uh, places I've emailed. I also emailed to the uh, Amherst schools. They run a meal distribution program for poor families. So I sent it to two people who have responsibility for that program. My hope is that they will uh, take the, uh, the, the online form, print it and distribute it with food to people who come to the six or eight locations uh, where th these meals are available. Uh, I haven't gotten any feedback from that, but I hope so. Uh, Mindy Dom has also distributed on her Facebook sites and on Twitter. Uh, there was something else. <laughs> did it, did it go to the Survival Center? Did the Survival Center get it somehow? Uh, yes. Um, Lev is on my mailing list, mm -hmm. Lev Ben Ezra. So um, I'm sure she got it. On the other hand, one of my mailing lists or notes to Lev kicked back and said that she's away till July 20th. And uh, I'm not she, quite she, sure. What? Uh, we emailed today, so I think she knows about it. Yeah, well, late. she might've been away today because that's when I got it kicked back. Um, but maybe if you talk to Kelly, mm -hmm. <laughs> she'll know somebody else there who can be responsible for making sure it gets distributed at the Amherst Survival Center. Right. I mean, I'm hoping the email to the landlords, um, you know, I, I'm hoping they'll approach their tenants, you know, with it. We don't, I mean, I don't know how that works, but, um, you know, like I said, a few were interested in it and they had follow-up questions or something. So at least we know, I know it went out, but I'm really hoping that we'll get, you know, landlords interested. Yeah, I actually got an email a couple of weeks ago from a small Amherst landlord who has two tenants that she believes are eligible for the program. And uh, I did send her an email with the announcement. Uh, so we'll probably get something back from her tenants. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, are there any other ideas that we haven't uh, mentioned that people think we could uh, use? I don't have a particular thing in mind. I wonder if there are any, I can't think of them offhand, but if there are any um, immigrant support organizations, for instance, that we could uh, make sure get a copy. Um, like Center for New Americans, is, that, is there an office in Amherst for Center for New Americans? Yeah, they're part of the Amherst Human Service Network, so they would see that. I mean, I just thought when you said that, I thought of community legal aid. Uh, you know, they might not be, um, they, they should, they, I should, we should probably contact them directly. The Amherst Senior Center is also on my mailing list. Okay. Uh, to the director and one of the staff members. John, I'm not sure if you said this, but we could also reach out to Massachusetts Job, Jobs with Justice. They mm -hmm. might have a few ideas or be able to distribute it to, among their network. 
Okay, good idea, Will, thanks. How about, how about churches, the churches and synagogue? I was gonna say the exact same thing, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> Bless um, you, Erica. <laughs> at least a half a dozen of those, the pastors or somebody else is on my email list. I'm not sure whether it's enough, but it includes at least half a dozen churches in Amherst. Um, maybe we could do it a little bit more systematically to make sure we, we don't leave anybody out. And the JCA. Yeah, the JCA is on my list. Judith Swain's on my list yeah, right. as is the rabbi. Um, I'm not sure the mosque in Hadley is on my list. I don't know if I have an email for that. If anybody has contact there, that would be another to. Include. I think I could. I think I could get it through a circuitous route, but I think I could get it there if you. Yeah, I could get it there. Okay. Good, Carol. Thanks. Any other thoughts? I just emailed it to the uh, the Amherst Pelham neighbor to neighbor group. Oh. Um, yeah. That's and I do think if John, right, if John, I saw John's email to the schools and the lunch program. I mean, that's if that goes out, that'll be um, that would you know reach a lot of families too directly. I don't know how they would, you know, if they'd send an email out, but that'd be a good one. I don't, yeah, I don't have too much else. I mean, I, I guess I can email a few more places and we can see what happens. I mean, it seems like the word's out there. If you already received 26 applications or 22 or whatever the number. Yeah. As of right now, I'm not worried, but <laughs> <laughs> it could slow. I mean, sometimes you get a lot in the beginning and then it slows down. So, yeah. That's what you would expect. But I, at the level that it's funded, we kind of guess that it could serve as much as 80 households, maybe even more, depending on how many are family, family versus single. Um, okay, there were a couple of issues that have come up uh, that I thought we would talk a little bit about, seek everybody's advice on these. Um, one has to do with the fact that there are several uh, pieces of demographic information that are requested on the application. Um, and Nate raised the concern that that might be a barrier to some households in applying either because uh, it introduced the level of complication or they were reluctant to answer those questions. And as a consequence, they, they might not complete that information. Uh, Jana, on the other hand, just speaking for her for a minute, um, said that uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley uses that information on all of their programs or maybe virtually all of their programs and it's part of information they need on reporting to the federal and state government about who enrolls in their programs. And so even though this is a separate program from Amherst, um, they still would follow um, that, that procedure. Uh, I was wondering whether or not you could allow people to simply skip those and it would show up as missing data, but you wouldn't necessarily tell people that they could skip it. So that very few would end up not filling it out since it would be present there. Uh, usually with an online application, if you skip an item, the application will say, uh-oh, <laughs> you missed this, you've got to get this, it's a required field. So those are the concerns, if you like, that have gone back and forth between Nate, Jana, and myself. Uh, one of the options would be to say, okay, we're keeping them all in, they're all required. Uh, 
another would be to drop them all. So what do people think about those questions? I could also just, just to clarify too on what, so the way that the online application is, is set up, um, race, so these are all listed as required fields. Race has a decline. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Military status I made not uh, required. Um, I could add decline to the other ones. And so people could not, they could choose not to answer ethnicity. Uh, primary language is kind of important for us to be able to communicate. With the applicant. Um, but I could, I could make the other ones not, I could put decline so that folks wouldn't have to fill it out. The education one um, is only required on the head of household. I could make it, I mean, that one, I have mixed feelings about why we ask it in general. Um, but uh, I, so, and I work status, I included for the head of household, because again, I feel like that's actually sort of helpful information for the program to know, uh, you know, what they check off. But um, my concern about keep putting them all is not required is that then people will skip them entirely. Um, but we could add a decline so that folks could just choose if not to um, answer them if they didn't want to. That seems fair to me. Then you, so you know that someone looked at it, they had to see it, but they can decide that I don't really want to answer this, but you know that they decided that they didn't just miss it. They didn't just <laughs> yeah. not see it there or something. So you, uh, as long as there's an active ability to say, I don't want to answer this, Seems okay to me. Is that for the items that Jenna described where she would include that or for all of the items, Carol, in your mind? I could probably go either way, especially the ones that already have something like that there, yeah, like sexual, whatever it is, you can say other, uh, race, you can say you decline. I don't, I, I wasn't thinking about this when I ever looked at it the first time, so. Yeah, I mean, it may not be an issue. I mean, I didn't realize that some of the things were to say decline, so I do kind of like that option. That means they've actively had to answer the question as opposed to not knowing if they skipped it or missed it. Um, yeah. I will say on gender, um, I, I can't, I can leave it other, I can't put decline. I have a, the database, <laughs> I have to have first name, last name, date of birth and gender in order to put, like those are the four unique identifiers that the agency uses to not duplicate people. Um, so that one would be really hard for me to have decline. Mm -hmm. But you can have other. Yeah. So, okay. I could also add other things if people wanted it to not say other, but to say other um, categories. Well, I mean, I know for the race, the HUD has those, um, you know, odd, you know, categories. And so, um, you know, when we, for some of our agencies, sometimes a lot of them come back and there, a lot of others just checked because, you know, either people are uncomfortable or they, you know, how do you, you know, if you can only check one, I mean, I think the, um, yeah, as long as the trust doesn't feel like it would be a, you know, a barrier. I just didn't want, you know, applicants to become ineligible if they feel uncomfortable answering one or two of these demographic questions. And so, you know, we, as a trust, we had never discussed that. And I just, you know, just now we, we can now, I just want to make sure that we're, you know, we wouldn't be excluding, um, you know, potential applicants. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, John, looks like, looks like Mindy, Mindy Dom's in attendance and she has her hand raised. Oh, okay. Uh, Welcome, Mindy. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, Mindy, you can unmute yourself. You, you'll be able to speak. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Barely. Buddy, thank you for, I'm thrilled to be here and kind of listen in on the implementation of this incredible, wonderful program. Um, I was going to you're fading out. Can you hear me better now? I'm, I'm going to be right on top of my computer. Yeah. Um, for gender, I was going to suggest if it's possible with the community action um, database 
that the third option should be an X. Um, and the reason why I'm suggesting that is that um, I, actually, I actually have legislation in the state around creating a non-binary option on state applications and forms. And currently, um, the RMV uses an X for a third non-binary option for gender on driver's licenses. So instead of other, we could conceivably put an X and that would allow people who consider um, themselves non-binary to see that they're represented in those options. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to listen in. Thanks, Mindy, and thanks for distributing this to your network. My pleasure. I wanted to tell you, I think I texted you, John. I've also sent it to other elected officials and um, the United Way. And I think that you may want to also include the housing court in the places that you send it to. Okay, good idea. Yeah, I want to agree with Mindy uh, with regard to gender. Um, but I'm really torn with... Um, you know, having it all be voluntary in terms of uh, putting in there or not. I mean, certainly decline um, is an option, but I think it's important also, um, maybe it needs to be said there somewhere um, that we want to ensure representation and that's why we want some of this information um, because we also want to make sure we're targeting or that we're including, um, I don't like the word targeting, sorry, including as many, um, members from our community as possible. And if we're not reaching them, I think then, you know, we have to rethink how we're doing this. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, sometimes we don't will, but service agencies do when we have walk on funding is say that, you know, we encourage them, but it's not um, required. But I think on the online application, I guess it's maybe you don't have the ability, I don't know if there's an ability to write, you know, like a disclaimer in or something or like, you know, used for, uh, grant reporting only or, you know, stays in house. I mean, you know, just I think sometimes we get questions like, you know, does this get reported back to federal authorities? For the most part, it's no, it doesn't. So I, you know, I don't know if there's a way to add that um, on the application just so it eases people's and, you know, apprehensions if there are any. Yeah. No, I think I can totally, I think that's a great idea. I can do that. I can send, I'll draft up a sentence or two and then I can send it. Um, to John and Nate to just make sure that it's capturing what you want it to say, but. Um, like many ways, many okay, thanks. Okay, I wanna move on to another item. Um, we all agreed that a letter should be sent out to landlords asking them if they would match or contribute in some way to additional rent forgiveness beyond uh, the emergency rental assistance program. And uh, both Dana and Nate, I believe, said that we really should have some kind of form that the landlord sends back to us if they are going to do rent forgiveness. I, on the other hand, were thinking, why do we want to add other paperwork to this program? Uh, and so I wasn't sure that we needed to do that, but really just have some informal process where landlords could email back their response. So uh, I guess I'm willing to be outvoted by Jana and Nate, unless somebody else um, has a thought about this. Well, and I just want to clarify that I actually was suggesting that we give them a sample lease addendum that they could use because I, I feel like if I was the landlord, I wouldn't want to just have like a verbal agreement with my tenant that I've reduced their rent for three months. They, you know, the, the lease is going to say that they owe that money. And so if there was a way to say, oh, and you can use this, here's a sample lease addendum that you could, you could sign and have your tenant sign and attach to your lease that um, reduces the rent for those three months so that they feel like their lease is still valid um, and it would save them the time of actually fit, like writing up their own lease addendum because I think they would not want to do that. <laughs> Nate, would that satisfy you? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I thought I, 
yeah, I think the lease addendum is fine. I mean, I think, you know, along those lines is just to have some, you know, formal way of that, of kind of documenting that. Otherwise it's, um, you know, just, it's, you know, you, you know, a landlord might just say yes. <laughs> Maybe they think that means they would get the, the, it would help them win the lottery for their tenant or something. I, I don't know, right? Or I, I'm not sure why they would if they wouldn't, but um, yeah, I mean, I think there was like a, you know, one page addendum that seemed pretty simple. It was like fill in the blanks if a landlord is willing to, and it was pretty generic and easy. I guess it seems important to me that there's some <clears throat> place where there's a record of the agreement so that you can't have either the tenant or the landlord come back and say, I never said that. You really owe it, even though I said you didn't or whatever. Just so, just so <laughs> there's some way to go back if there becomes something unclear later about, well, what did you really mean? I thought we didn't have to pay any more rent forever. And no, or whatever, you know, it just seems like it would be useful to both parties to have some record of whatever the agreement was. <clears throat> oh. Okay, well, Jenna, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, so we're gonna send the landlord uh, an agreement, right? That says, we agree that this person's our tenant and that we're gonna accept this amount of money from the town of Amherst for these X amount of months. Um, we could also then send them the, you know, at this, we could have then also say, if you're going to reduce your rent for those three months for, with your tenant, send us back a copy of your lease addendum with your contract. I don't want to hold up the process necessarily and have them then take a long time. But um, I feel like my experience with landlords is you really only get one chance to get the documents back. And it's usually when you are, they are waiting to get money from you. And so if we pay them, I think we're give, they're getting less incentive to return something. Um, so if we are trying to sort of get it all at once and sort of wrap it up and then they don't have to talk to us again, you know, every month, then that might be an incentive for them to return. I apologize if there's any landlords on the phone, but uh, sometimes, you know, it's just easier if they are looking for your payment. Don't we also want to provide an incentive for them to be recognized by the town as, as being part of this program? So I think we want to collect their names as well. And, and maybe not how much, you know, we don't necessarily want to publish how much they forgave, but a cumulative amount of, of forgiveness seems like it would be something positive to publish. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Rob. Okay, well, we'll work something out with Jana that includes the addendum, but also lets them know in the letter that we do intend to publish the names of landlords who have put in their own rent forgiveness, but not the amounts. Great. Okay, there are only a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. Um, uh, Nate, you might want to talk about this. Um, there is apparently an avenues from the state or federal CARES program where the state will end up reimbursing us for 200 of the $250,000 that we've agreed to put into this program. Is that correct, Nate? Yeah, it may be all of it. I think, you know, we're, you know, the, you know, um, just from talking with the finance director and uh, accounting in town, you know, th this is, um, you know, this really is in response to COVID. So it's not as if, you know, I mean, we say, it, you know, we say it is in everything. So it seems like we can get reimbursed through that. So, you know, if we were just doing a rental program and it wasn't so directly related to the loss of income because of COVID, it wouldn't, it would be harder to be, um, you know, reimbursed. But I really think that this seems eligible. So I've sent information um, to different staff who I think then conferred with, you know, I don't know what agency they're working with, but uh, it seems like this is eligible for reimbursement. So, you know, we, we do have to, the town has to pay out first and then we would request reimbursement at some time uh, later. But yeah, I think we may even be able to recoup the whole cost. Uh, 200,000 was originally for um, what, what was thought was the rental subsidy amount, but I, I even think the full cost can be recouped. Uh, we're still working on that. Okay, that's great. It also means that uh, 
after we get through with phase one and we look at what we've learned, if we want to expand the program and continue it into another phase, um, then we would probably have the resources to do it, whether we get reimbursed for that second phase or not. So I think that's very good news. Yeah, I think the only caveat there is we need to spend the money by the end of the um, calendar year, which I think, you know, I don't think will be a problem, but. Uh... Right, we should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Could I just clarify calendar year being December? Correct, yeah, not fiscal year, but just I think calendar year is what I was told. Two other items to mention. Um, Wayfinders has just announced a new expanded raft program that uh, people can apply for. It's actually a new state program. Again, I believe using federal money, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, in any event, it's broader than our program in a number of ways. The one that I particularly recall is that it would include uh, mortgage payments not just rental subsidies, but also mortgage payments. And that will be a first come first serve program. There aren't population or other priorities for it. Um, and I believe those applications are probably now available online. It's a statewide program, but in the Pioneer Valley, um, it's run by uh, Wayfinders. So it's possible we'll have some people applying to both programs, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I don't know quite how you would handle that, Jana, but it would be a possibility. Well, we ask them if they're currently receiving RAFT, but we don't right. ask them if they've applied. So um, when we send the landlord verification out to the landlord asking, you know, saying, asking them to sign off, we do ask, you know, are, are they receiving assistance from anywhere else? So sometimes if there is a lag from when they apply to us and then let's say they got approved by raft and raft paid something then presumably the landlord would know and if that was the case then you know we would perhaps reduce what we were going to pay i mean or you know figure it out with wayfinders um so yeah, yeah it would could extend the program so that they get three months from us and three months from wayfinders it could mm -hmm. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, CHAPA, uh, in collaboration with Mass Housing Partnership, did a survey of, uh, a voluntary survey with towns and cities that are doing these programs. And I believe there is something in the neighborhood of 20 programs that now are launched or will be launched shortly, and another 10, 20 towns or cities that are considering launching these programs. Now there are 356 towns and cities in Massachusetts, but nonetheless, if we had as many as 40 towns and cities that were undertaking this, that would have a very significant statewide impact because I think we're talking about um, larger rather than smaller communities. And I did send people a link to the CHAPA MHP report if you're interested in knowing more. Uh, so unless there are other comments or questions, I think that wraps us up for discussion of emergency rental assistance. All okay, right. Thanks, thanks very much, Dana. For having me. Thanks. And I will nice be meeting class. you. Yeah, nice to see everyone. Thank you. Oh, uh, wait, how do I get out? Oh, there. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, the next, uh, most of the next items are relatively brief items, I think. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals has now met twice to discuss Amherst Studio Apartments. And I was gonna say a little bit about them. I know, I think Laura's sitting out there. So if she wants to add what I have to say or maybe just substitute for me, um, we can do that. If you're out there, Laura, could you raise your hand? and Nate can recognize you. She raised her hand, she's, she's brave. Laura, you can, you can speak. Ben. 
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, yeah, we just um, embarked at last on our hearings with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I think some folks here listened in or participated. Uh, the initial hearing was a presentation primarily by Valley about the project um, with uh, a bevy of questions coming to us from the Zoning Board. And then the next hearing was public comment. And again, some of you spoke and I really appreciate it. Um, most of the commentary was positive. We didn't have a lot of uh, critical comments. Um, and there's been a mix. John's been keeping you apprised of the letters and things, public comments, written public comments that have been coming in. Um, again, strong level of support with some mixed in with some pretty fairly intense critical commentary by um, people who live nearby. Uh, our next hearing will be on August 6th, and we'll continue the discussion then with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, people who can join are most welcome, because I think from here on, they'll at least include some portion of each hearing for public comment, and so people can speak their mind or they can address other comments that they've heard during the hearing. So the more the merrier. Yeah, uh, we'll say at the last hearing, the chair allowed approximately three minutes for each public comment, which is still significant. Um, I assume the same thing that will happen on August 6th at 6.30. Um, I'll probably send out a, an announcement and a link just before. But if you can put it in your calendars, it's great for the Zoning Board of Appeals to hear real people in the community um, talking about the support for the project in addition to receiving um, written testimony. Right, uh, I, I, I would agree with that. And, and to give a balance. I mean, if they were hearing, you know, 10 negative comments in a row, it would affect them. And so we always want it to be a balance of comments that are, that are being heard by the zoning board. Um, also, if people want to follow along, the town's done a nice job of posting a lot of information online. So our zoning application is there. You can see what the plans look like now. Um, you can revisit the supportive services plan if you want to. You can look at budgets. So really, really a wealth of information is available online. Yeah, I think the August 6th meeting will focus at least in part on the social server services support plan. Um, because it didn't seem as many of the ZBA members were familiar with that in the earlier two meetings. And it does appear that that's something they wanted to spend more time talking about. Right. So if anybody has anything to say in particular about that, um, again, I would welcome it as obviously Laura would. I was gonna say, um, just you know, to remind it, press members or if you wanna let people know, they can also, you can also submit comments online. There's an online form or you can send an email to myself or to uh, Maureen Pollock is the planner who staffs the ZBA. So comments can also be submitted in writing and they're transmitted to the ZBA as well. I think the ZBA, my thought on it is they've been they've been talking about some pretty small details in my mind on the project and I think the social service plan and there's some questions my neighbors about you know why 28 units why not less why not family units so I think maybe in August there'll be a more kind of robust discussion about some of the substantive issues of the project and so it could be good to have people there to support it I mean the ZBA has been talking about you know landscaping and trees and things which is you know an important part of their review but I feel like either the members are satisfied with the plans or they just haven't been asked to just to, they haven't talked much about in general in terms of, you know, the number of units or that it's you know, studio apartments it's been kind of quiet about that. So I'm not sure how, you know, what will happen in the future meetings. So I think more support and explaining the need for that, the better. Okay, any other comments or questions about the ZBA process? Then we will move on. John, there's a um, hand. Elisa Campbell. Oh. Um, okay. Somebody have a hand up, Nate? Yep. Am I unmuted now? 
Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. I just want to say that my impression is, maybe unfairly, that members of the ZBA, for the most part, have no understanding of how much housing costs. I think, you know, they haven't been dealing with this issue for months and months, and so they really don't understand the need as well as I think they should. So I would like to encourage people to weigh in on that topic. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Alyssa. Okay. Um, Nate has been trying to get contracts for a wetlands consultant and possibly another consultant related to both the East Street School site and uh, the um, Strong Street site. So where are you with that now, Nate? Yeah, actually, um, there's a, a consultant out of Wendell who's, um, or I'm working on a contract for the East Street School site now. And um, I thought I would have had uh, a little more information. You know, he provided one quote just to go out and do the flagging. And then we, you know, we're at, we actually want you know the consultant to bring this to the conservation commission and get it, um, you know, approved as a delineation. So previously we had someone study it, but it didn't go anywhere. So it was never a formal wetland delineation. And so um, the consultant we're working with is willing to do that. And um, so you know, I'm hoping maybe in the next week we'll have a contract signed uh, for East Street School. And then, you know, you mentioned Strong Street, but East Street was the priority. So I'm just trying to get that moving. Okay, and is there any word when the town would allow people to come in to look at the, um, the asbestos and lead issues in the building? Uh, I, uh, just this week, they said that they would allow people in. So um, starting, you know, Mid July, they'll let people in. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to reach back out to um, AccuTech or I forget who it was um, who had been in there before. But yeah, I mean, I was just told this week that they're allowing people in to the building now, consultants. So. Okay, it would be great if we could move East Street along and even get started with Strong Street since people know my preferences to be looking to get the next thing into the pipeline, not to sit back and say, oh, it's great, we've got A and B going, but to start to think about how to get C and D going as well. Yeah. yeah. I assume that there's nothing happening on Hickory Ridge at this point? Uh, no, I've heard that it's, you know, still uh, looking positive for the town, but nothing, nothing yet. Okay, any other questions or comments on uh, East Street or Strong Street or anything else related to finding new sites? Anybody have a new site we can go for? <laughs> okay, uh, next item is pretty brief. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually quite sure about this. But I believe that the CPAC uh, has made two recommendations related to housing to town council, but I don't think they've been reviewed by town council yet. One would give approximately $245,000 to Valley Community Development to start up a new home buyer program in Amherst. They had one a few years ago, which they did pretty successfully. The new program, like the older one, would allow for um, four households to be supported through the home buyer program. It is getting harder and harder to locate possible homes in it. But nonetheless, they've had some success in the past. And I think it's great that CPAC has voted to recommend that program to the town council. The second thing I heard, and I can't even remember where I heard it, was that CPAC also included $200,000 for the housing trust in its recommendation to town council. Uh, so 
I guess I, I went around looking at various sites on the town web page and couldn't find any confirmation. But somewhere, I believe that that was communicated to me, even if I can't tell you the source at this moment. So both of those are great for us and great for affordable housing for the town, assuming that I've got it right. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, in the future, we're going to have to continue to work on CPAC for support. We've done pretty well for the last few years, and I hope we continue to be able to do that in the future. Um, I had a couple of legislative updates. Um, since Mindy's on, if you want to uh, talk about what uh, you're familiar with related to housing or augment whatever I have to say, that would be great. Uh, the House and Senate have agreed on language for the FY 2020 supplemental budget, which is basically money appropriated in addition to the principal budget that they passed earlier. The good news is that it includes uh, $20 million to expand RAP. Uh, CHAPA had been pushing for $60 million, but I suppose they'll be happy with 20 and hope to get uh, uh, maybe 60 million in the FY 21-21 budget. That would be good. The budget also includes 13 and a half million for housing authorities and 5.8 million for permanent supported housing, which I guess goes into the DHCD budget. Uh, so that's good news on the uh, positive end for funding for affordable housing. Um, two other things that have happened that I thought I would mention, um, and these are bills introduced by uh, people in the House and Senate. In the House, um, Mike Connolly and Kevin Honan have filed a bill to protect family stability for tenants. Uh, homeowners also, and certain multifamily housing owners impacted by COVID-19. Uh, these protections would lengthen the eviction moratorium. And a number of people, you may have also received other emails about extending the eviction moratorium. So this bill that's been introduced would accomplish that. Uh, the bill will be assigned to the housing committee, which I think is a joint committee. So if people want to send uh, letters or emails of support, I think that would help push that along. And then the other thing earlier in June, Senator Sal Domenico uh, filed legislation to create a statewide route to count, right to counsel pilot program. And again, that's something that we voted for and asked town council to push as well, which they agreed to do. So if we're moving toward a right to counsel program to help to prevent eviction, that would be great as well. Um, Mindy, if you're still out there, is there anything you wanted to add? Maybe not. Okay. No, I don't think Mindy's, uh, Mindy's here anymore, John. Okay, thanks. Any other notes or thoughts about uh, affordable housing related legislation? Okay, then moving on to the next item. Um, we're getting towards the end of the agenda, folks. Uh, there is an opening for a new trust member. This is the position that Nancy Schroeder uh, left uh, now two months ago or three months ago, I can't recall exactly. Um, uh, anyway, uh, at this point, I think there could be as many as 10 people who have applied for the open position. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure they've all applied. Some may be holdovers from the last application who may still be interested or may not, but there are 
10 people on Angela Mills' list. She's the one who's managing these for uh, the town manager. And she's working on setting up uh, interviews with the candidates, um, hopefully, which will occur later this month. So I'm not sure if there's still, uh, the town manager is still entertaining new applications. Um, if you know somebody who's interested, um, check back with me or with Angela Mills and we'll find out if there's still additional opportunities for people to apply. I think, I was just trying to look quickly, you still can uh, complete a citizen activity form, right? I think that's, I'm just seeing if, I think anyone, I think you can submit at any time. And so if someone's interested, I would just, I would encourage you to, um, I'm trying to find it actually online, is that funny? Interest in survey. Yeah, oh, community activity form is called now. So yeah, I think you can complete that um, anytime and submit it, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the only other item that I had is just to mention upcoming events. Um, we already talked about the uh, ZBA hearing on 132 Northampton Road, which will be on August 6th at 6.30 p.m. Um, if you can put that into your calendar to potentially speak on that occasion, that would be great. The scheduled date for the next housing trust meeting is Thursday, August 13th, which would again be at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Is there any public comment that we haven't heard already this evening? Anybody raising a hand, Nate? No, I was going to say, um, I think I'd emailed the trust saying the uh, planning board would discuss 4DR next week, and they may not. I think there's, um, they're reviewing the Amherst Media site plan for the new headquarters, and that was continued to July 15th. Depending on how long that that uh, review goes, they may not discuss 4DR um, next week. So I'll, I'll just, I'll email the trust, you know, sometime next week just to see if there's any thought on that from the planning board chair. But, you know, if, I don't want people to sit around for two hours waiting for them to discuss it, but I'll let you know if I think it will be an agenda item and I'll get to it. Thank you. Yeah, that's like, uh, <laughs> that's like someone told me that uh, town council discussed something and, um, earlier in June and it was, it was almost a five hour meeting. And uh, so I finally, I was like, well, when in the meeting am I gonna have to watch five hours <laughs> to listen to 10 minutes? <laughs> luckily someone could tell me, luckily someone emailed me and told me when, when I could start listening. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't, I don't want anyone to, you know, it's recorded anyway, so if, if you can't make it for next week or when they talk about it, you can always watch it later, but I think you know, the, the planning board has received a lot of comments about 40R, and so they're discussing whether or not it's something to move forward with in a downtown or you know, more, move forward with at all right now. So I, you know, I, think, I think they haven't had a chance to really discuss it um, amongst themselves, which they hope to do soon. Okay, um, I don't have any additional items. Anybody else have anything they wanna raise before we sign off? Okay, well, um, this time we're leaving you with the rest of the evening actually open. You can all go online and watch Hamilton or something else <laughs> uh, if you'd like to do that. I thank everybody for participating in this meeting and uh, for your comments on our emergency rental assistance plans. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Okay, is right. everybody- Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.